Jason. We are recording. Go for that. I'm sure you all just received a notification about that. <laughs> so do you just want us to kick off with the community welcoming us? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think the the meeting today is the last meeting, if you recall, if I go back here, we kind of did some operational stuff. We talked about the release process. Um, we talked about metrics models and toolkits. Do you remember all this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was it was kind of operational. Like we were thinking about when oh, we talked about like how will that release process, like what these should look like. And I thought today we could kind of get back into away from the operations a little bit and back to the work that um, Sean and Regava have been doing with respect to deploying a particular metrics model. So the idea here is that we would have like a metrics model, whatever it might be, community welcoming this or you know anything else that's kind of on this list here. And as we develop them, the hope is, is that we can have implementable solutions towards these, right? That we can have something that actually de demonstrates these in practice. So not only does it help people kind of bring metrics together, but it also allows people to see these in practice. And that's kind of what this is. And I, I thought we could kind of listen to Regava and Sean talk about, you know, how they've gone about doing this and maybe what their experience has been in this. Because it's sometimes yeah. it's easy for us to say, hey, we developed a metrics model. <laughs> you tool, tool people just go develop it. And we'll see yeah. you next week. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was hoping you could talk through that a little bit. Yeah, we sure can. Um, maybe to start with, um, Regava, I'll share my screen and discuss the process that we went through, and then you can actually demonstrate the model, if that makes sense. Yeah, sounds good, Sean. All right. Um, so we created two new directories for implementations and toolkits. We can decide on some other form of functioning as we go forward if that's if these subdirectories don't work but this is where I, we I think, started let me let me just <clears throat> stop you there too and i think this is kind of what we decided so as we capture the metrics model in this repository the the artifacts that follow the models would also live in this repo you know what i mean that we wouldn't have another repository called like Model, model implementations or yeah, something. something like that that we just we create some folder so i think i agree with what you did here so yeah and i think um you know at some point then as we release the metrics one thing is i as i was looking for where to put this one i wasn't i didn't look at the spreadsheet so uh, i think it makes sense to um go into the focus areas and i don't remember which focus area it was under but might have been project health 101 and then just add this implementation to the readme. And I think also probably we should flesh out the actual metric model fully, um, which Ragava and I kind of did, and I'll show you that. Okay. So what, what we did is we took the Google doc that Elizabeth sketched out and we went through a little bit of a design process and that design process, and tell me if I go too wide here, um, Essentially, and this link doesn't work anymore because we, we rearranged the repo a little bit. Um, it was relevant metrics for getting a picture of how welcoming a community is. And the we, we took each item that Elizabeth identified, for example, issue age, and identified the chaos metric that's behind it. And then the endpoint or other data gathering strategy that we used to get the information, in this case, out of an Augur instance, though, I think we could do something similar with Grimoire Labs SIG ILS project or SIGILS project. Um, so, but this is implemented using an Augur backend. And then, so you had issue response time, um, time to first response. And we just kind of explained these different places that we have data, um, these two metrics, and then the endpoints that deliver them. Community culture, we show the code of conduct, um, inclusive leadership. We didn't have a clear metric drive from data for inclusive leadership right now. So we just, right now, just noting that in this design 
markdown document. And then for license coverage, we identified these examples for license coverage, licenses declared, um, under stability, the CII best practices badge. Um, we don't have a test coverage endpoint, although we've defined these metrics, and so this is just not in there right now. We do have bus factor. Regava implemented that. Um, we have committer information. Um, we don't have elephant factor. And then um, we did, I think some of this is a little out of date. <clears throat> we have some new contributor. This is actually a visualization endpoint, which means that it essentially brings up a visualization when you hit it. And you'll see that in the notebook. And then change request acceptance rate. So this is just kind of a working document that we went through where Elizabeth identified the metrics to include. And we went through and identified where to get the data. And then Regava did a good deal of work preparing the data to be not pretty presentable. Um, I would say that Jupyter notebooks are generally not the most beautiful creatures on Earth, but you know they do they do function, and um, so they're useful in that way. And if I go back here, get out of this document, there is a README that just within so inside this implementation of community welcoming this, the README explains very briefly how to create a Python virtual environment install things and run it. And I think that's a good thing to include so that yes. people who are less technical have at least a little bit of guidance. Uh, perhaps some other distribution mechanism might be more ideal in the future. Um, for example, we have discussed making these models available on a server where people could just see them running, um, but we haven't done that yet. Um, we've just talked about it. And I will breathe and ask, see if there's any questions. Rogava then will illustrate the metric itself. So I have a few questions, but I'll see oh, if we'll do too. Oh, are there questions in chat? Uh, I'm, no. I'm sh okay. I'm worried about asking. I'm worried about asking questions that you might be about to answer. So I don't um... <laughs> yeah. ask away. Ask. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it just leads the question. I mean, first of all, it's awesome. First, like that looks great. That's kind of sort of how I was imagining the organization of things. So I think that's really awesome. Uh, I was just wondering when you went to the the table there that had the different columns and there's like the yeah. I know, I, um, in the design I, MD document. design yeah and so sorry design is the would be like the thing you do for every single. Well, I mean, I was, this is the or is process. That like, for, is that like a standard name? I, and that, that wasn't actually my It's question. not, it's not a standard name. <laughs> okay. In fact, it was the README before I made a real README for end users. And hmm. as you can see, I still call it README MD. I have to fix that. Um, I, I like it though. It makes sense to me. Like for some reason that jives with like what I think I'm looking at, right? It's like, it's like a map or like a, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't sew, but like a sewing pattern or something where you're about to like go and do something with it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's basically our analysis of yeah that's probably yeah. better uh yeah. but the endpoint strategy so the way i was thinking like there'd be multiple types of things in there at some point right like there's this one that you've you've spun up to as an example of how to look at issue age using auger but uh -huh. there could be other tools or things that absolutely people are looking at yeah yeah okay cool yeah i was just more clarifying then thank you that looks yeah that's all i have uh, you, thank you emma other questions before Regava illustrates the notebook? Lucas, did you have something? Oh, I was going to um, see about getting a demo, but I believe that's exactly what Regava That is exactly what's next, yeah. <laughs> so to that's Emma's cool. point, I'll wait for you answering the question anyway. OK. Go All for right. it, Regava. You're on. Um, and Regava, why don't you just um, Sure, I, I guess the, the piece that's in the README that you're not seeing is how Regava started this notebook from the command line. Um, so, okay. and that's okay because it's in the README, but just so you know, Jupyter notebooks are kind of a command line startup thing, at least as far as I've used them. There may be other approaches available out there, but this is how we have implemented it right now. And now I'll let you talk. <clears throat> yeah. 
Thanks, Sean. So, Sean, do you want me to start from the terminal or just, just start with the job? No, you can just go from here. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, me and Sean, we both collaborated in this thing and we, uh, with the help of Elizabeth, has developed this thing. And uh, I've done... So with Jupyter Notebooks, you get a lot of code. Yep. So the oh. first thing which we have done is the issue age. So this one, I, I want to take this one out, remember. <laughs> <laughs> it basically yeah. says, this graph says, the, the farther away the date of opening is, the older an issue is. And it's okay. sort of like reverse explanatory. <laughs> yeah, like how long the issue was open. So. We we have di distributed this you you know, like the month and year, but then was it open the longest? So yeah, and on yeah. the y axis we have the days like how many days it was open. So right, this is for the so issue age. This just needs a little bit of engineering. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's just scroll past that one. Yep, I should remove that. Then we have issue response time which is hitting a database directly yeah. with the read-only user. Yeah, we don't have an available in the, it's a, the read-only user is contributed as part of the repo. So anybody would have access to that, to the database's read-only user to get this data. Yep. So issue response time is something like how much time passes between opening of an issue and the response first it made from any other, other contributor. So again, we have distributed this across the uh, across the date and the day when when the first issue was responded. Yep. So yeah, we could see. So in the second month of Augur's existence, through the fourth or fifth month, we were pretty terrible at responding to issues. But okay, that's how I read it. And then something yeah. happened. And we had a few we had a few hiccups here and there. Yeah, on the fifth. Yeah. The you know May of 2021. Yeah, that was the yeah. end of the school year, probably. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what that is. <laughs> Would be my guess. Um, okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's interesting on a couple couple levels, right? Because it allows you to see. No, just go back to that visual. Yeah, just go back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it tells you a variety of things, and it having having it captured as part of welcoming this. I can read this as the community is getting pretty good at at least responding to issues or at least making a comment on an issue. That's how I read this. Mm -hmm. um, again, with some hiccups, but that's that's as expected in community work. Um, and then the nice thing is, is this same endpoint could show up, um, you know, kind of in a different metrics model once we get these developed because issue response time could certainly mean something different it's not about welcoming this. It could be from a from a community manager perspective, like trying to understand what that hiccup is on the fifth or the on May of 2021. And I see something around Christmas. <laughs> I see yeah, something yeah, else yeah. at the end of the year again. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, you can see my academic cycles. Yeah, um, you certainly can. Here. <laughs> Just trying to get an understanding of of why issues issue response time is the way it is sometimes, which is different than welcoming this. Is basically, geez, it was at the end of every semester during the pandemic. Yeah, it's the end <laughs> of the semester and Christmas. Yeah, yeah or Christmas the, is the end of the semester too. So during the it? pandemic, yeah. So my well, pandemic you know, blips. Yeah. I'm tired of being at my computer all day. <laughs> and you have papers to grade. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Keep, keep going now, Rago. Next we have is issue time to first response. So a bit similar to that, but this is the first first response time to that issue. So which looks somewhat so how is this? Yeah. So some of these look a little bad. All of these look kind of bad, actually. And I think we are generally pretty bad at that first response. What's the close duration? What is that? So how political? long it takes to close the issue? Oh, okay. Yeah. The actually, is this the closed duration or is this the time to first response? We have this label wrong. This is this is not time to uh, this is this is issue resolution duration, Ragava. 
So the title. Um, so the title is wrong on this one. This is not time to first response. This is issue resolution duration. Okay. So we can change that. So yeah. then, right. So with that title, this reads considerably yeah. better. Than all yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you want to fix? Uh, I. You'll have to pull the repo again, Regava, because I rearranged some things. But yeah. Keep, so we know to fix that. Yep. We could do that. I just noted down that. Yep. And then we have code of conduct. Now this is pretty simple, right? Yep. It, it just basically provides a link to the code of conduct, which it derives from uh, the most recent code of conduct that Augur has made a reference to. Okay. Um, so this is just kind of it's a yes it's kind of present yeah it's either there or it's not okay um yep. could you pull the text you can click on that link and it'll bring the text up okay uh oh or not uh oh you know what um it's the dot 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 at the okay. end so that's the problem yeah, is I it's it's it. actually not showing the whole yeah just don't try it regava don't worry about it we yeah. can make don't that a, we can make a note to make that a url that's clickable because it certainly looks as though it's clickable because <clears throat> i would because it could be interesting too to kind of see the type of code of conduct mm -hmm. as well Absolutely. yeah i mean in terms of the type the basically i think inspection is the best way oh yeah it would have to be like a human inspection yeah. but just being able to get the human there would be cool Okay, Regava, keep going. Yeah. So the next we have is licensing. So license is covered for Augur. The total files are 857. Licenses declared are 564. And the coverage is how much percentage out of the total files the license were declared. So it's 0. 0.658. Mm -hmm. You got this. Yeah, I imagine this uh, this data, the license declared data. Well, actually, I'm wondering where you get that from because I, um, I've been working on an S bomb lately and finding it's pretty tricky to get accurate the, licenses. So there's a file level licensing semantic that at the SPDX project in yeah. our Linux Foundation created, and this the tools that we've built read that header if it's present in the file, um, and it's difficult really to determine what the license might be on a particular file if there isn't a license declared. I, I think the Linux Foundation does generally not like to assume that it's the license declared at the project level, though I think many people do assume that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think they're right. But anyway, I just, I, uh, I would call out. Sean, don't the, you also yep. use, isn't this where you're using Nomos as well? Yes, so the data is actually gathered by the Physology reader Nomos. Which doesn't just look at the, it's not just like, like the SPDX short identifier. Yeah, okay, it tries so to I don't even know the, what my tools do. What does it do? <laughs> it tries to identify um, like text as associated with a published license. So it, it, it does a text scan to try to see if there's like, say a snippet from the GPL V2 or a snippet from, you know, say one of the BSD licenses okay. and assigns it that way. Okay. All right. If, if in Augur, there's there's just probably credit. wouldn't be anything like that, but yeah. What's that? I said in Augur, we probably don't have any language like that, but that explains why. So in, when you look at Augur and, um, the actual number of licenses, it's 167. That seems like a lot of licenses, but we have a copy of each license declaration file in our repository in order to present that as part of the front end. So that's how the Nomo scanner must be getting 167 licenses because everything that we've developed is MIT, but we have one example of 167 different licenses because we have that text file in our repository. Okay, well, we could debug that. But it, if it's the same text file, it should come down as one license identifier. No, it's one text file for every license. So we have the, the what do you call it? The, um, a complete 
so that you with your, when you're in the auger front end, if you see a license, you can click on it and see what that license says. So we okay. actually have the full license declaration for a number of different licenses in the I gotcha. repo. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So it ends up being very, very this. So the statistic is pretty silly for Augur, which is why under licenses declared, we actually looked at Grimoire Lab um, because Augur has 167 licenses and it's just a mess and it's very odd to have that many licenses on a project. So it, oh. it's more typical to see what you see down here for Grimoire Lab where they're all GPL three plus except yeah. one. Okay. So Emma had a question, <laughs> why are licenses included? In welcoming this i've had the same question i i didn't ask questions <laughs> i wasn't no, critical of it actually but i asked this question emma to elizabeth and she had a really good answer and i don't remember her answer <laughs> so so my thought of it my thought about it was this is how i rationalized that it made sense is some people only want to work on projects with copyleft licenses or only work on projects that fall into some other category of license and so the license that you declare could reduce the number of potential contributors to the project. Yeah, I figured it was something around like this license is the type of license I can work with. <clears throat> mm -hmm. My and I don't want to. I mean, I don't think it's important to like debate all this right now. I I would just be worried to um, have too much under these, where it's like you know I have a community manager and they're like. You know, I, I want to be able to value community welcomeness, and then they give them all this stuff, right? They don't even <clears throat> licenses never even cross their mind because it's something that the legal takes care of, and um, and that's just an example of licenses. But even like stability, anyways, I <clears throat> yeah. I maybe just challenges to try and be as as like simple or um, simple is not the right word, but you know, like. I get it. Well, yeah, yeah more, yeah. Because so, we can still break all these out into they're still valuable. I just I think that the more that it feels like a buffet and less like you know you ordered an eight course meal, um, yeah. then that might be helpful. But that's getting ahead of things. I just wanted to like kind of point it out. Well, you know, I, think, I think I think uh, uh, I guess I would want to double down on on Emma's point that kind of the broader it is, the harder it is to draw specific meaning. So for example, CII best practices is also part of the um, open SSF um, security scorecard um, and um, is a very broad metric indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I think it's very hard to present succinct information in a Jupyter notebook. So as a metrics model, example, it's perhaps not the ideal platform to work in. It was, a pl I think it's a place to start and we should maybe think about what other technologies can present this information in a more like visualized, you know, viewable on a single page, I think would be an, a sort of optimal goal. I have two comments on this. So one, I totally agree that keeping the metrics models like Shorter is it, and this is no, no comment on the work that we're looking at here. No, but it's good. It's good. I mean, it's yeah, good constructive but, feedback to keep this in mind because it's in the yeah. back of our minds. Like scrolling down this notebook is almost embarrassing. No, um, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's really good. And so um, I agree with that. And I actually think we've had this discussion before. And the nice yeah. thing is, is about community welcoming this. This has not been released by any means, so we can certainly. The other thing that is really cool to me here is that even if we don't include for example, CII best practice badging status in community welcomingness, there's now an endpoint in Augur. <laughs> like this is- there, And there always has been. It's, you know, it's kind of making some of the data that has always, always been there, quote unquote. Um, yeah. Like here's, and here's how you can make it useful. And it's in a, it's in a notebook. I mean, this, this all of a sudden became, becomes like really kind of portable mm -hmm. to me, to other, yes. to other um, metrics. Technologies. Models. Yeah, yep. which is really, really cool. Yeah, there's a, there was a lot in this metrics model. So yes, we do have the building blocks for yep. getting data in the next metrics model. I think we just maybe want to think about what other technologies we should consider so we can get it in a page and still have it be easily like usable cool. by a normal person. Right on. So thank you. No, this is not garbage that we're looking at. No, don't even say that, Sean. <laughs> I didn't. You know, I'm. I, I was sort of half kidding, but. You know, no, it, is, it hurts you know. when you hurts our hearts when you say that. I'm sorry, I don't <laughs> want to hurt your heart. 
I had one other, like, again, like out of scope of this presentation, and I don't know if I'm interrupting it, but how do we, I know we talked about people being able to say like, this is how I understood this. And like, when you're talking about, Mm -hmm. this is when everyone went on vacation or that kind of thing. Yeah, how are you, the, I'm wondering how we're visualizing that happening uh, or is that the ability like, to add comments? Yeah. And I, in a, I think there's kind of like a couple different audiences. Like there might be, if you have a team, you might want to like, just have like team comments about, I mean, we're working in the open though, so it's not really specific, but what I'm trying to say is there's like comments that are helpful to the team that's working with the metrics and then comments that are helpful to like other people using chaos metrics. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like those are two comment areas. Uh, and I'm wondering if you've thought about how to capture those without it becoming a runaway, like, this isn't how you measure that <laughs> kind of comment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do, I've thought about that. And I know we've talked about that. It's, I haven't figured out what technology lets us do that, but I feel like something yeah. should. That's an interesting question, Emma. I'd it was just interesting listening yeah. to you talk and like look at the data and describe it like and what you thought and oh that makes sense or that doesn't you know like that kind of yeah. like it was really dis- as interesting as the data yeah. itself a little description of the data could be added to the notebook now as it is and that would probably be helpful but i think when i listen to emma talk it's like when you put the let's, let's pretend that all of us on this call are like a team at microsoft like when it goes in front of us, like how do we capture that conversation? It's not just this um, like Zoom meeting, but like, like actual comment yeah. against mm-hmm. right. what we're seeing. Um, I've never thought about that, that whole process. And I think that's what you were talking about, Emma. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, um, cause I think that's where I think well, people will learn from each other. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. So again, like these, these charts are great. And, and this is awesome work, but how do we like help people? Like they might look at it for their project and then they'll want to know, oh, well, how did this work for this other project or how did they use this? Or, you know, I think that that's the, probably the part I'm as excited about as anything is that like sharing, but I think that's we're, cool. I'm ahead of things. So no, yeah, I think we're getting there. I think it's this, these steps are kind of syncing together. So that's cool. It's very cool. Yeah. So coming to the bus factor we have, so bus factor is something like highest number of commits made and who is making the bigger impact and the most active people. So I just took the top top six people from that. And then these are the number of comments each one of them has made. This is in a period of a year. There's a time period constraint on this as well. Okay. Which we should probably state Next thing we have. So <laughs> honestly, like the way, I, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I'm just thinking about from a welcoming this perspective again. I know that we're kind of having these are kind of two different conversations. One is showing the endpoints, the other is how this is related to welcoming this. But yeah, one is like maybe there's two models here. One is about really welcoming this in the pure sense of responsiveness, and the other is um welcoming this in terms of like more like risks like licenses and bus factor these are risk factors these are things that might be showstoppers for me but might not be in might not always be the indicators i want to use to try to explain how welcoming the community yeah. is i don't does this really show bus factor because isn't i mean so bus factor is like it's a it's a derivation of bus factor where we set a cutoff point um, as soon as you throw other contributors in there that's like, I think that gets weird then. Yeah, I mean, essentially, so the cutoff was like for 80% of the code. And if we went to 50% of the code, I think you'd see like these three here, or maybe just me and Carter <laughs> uh, as a bus factor. So it's, I think the way that I've pr- we've parameterized this is understating Augur's bus factor to some degree. Uh, yeah, 0.86 is what we have done. And, so the, yeah, uh, and probably explaining the thresholds for bus factor, which are part of the metric itself would be yeah. useful. Yeah. And then next we have is the test coverage. That's, that's not available right now. Yeah, we don't have it, but we it's indicated in the spec. Yep. 
And then we have committers. Top 10 committers, which Top I'd like 10. to add the email address to that. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, we could add the email addresses and uh, one more thing I'd like. So. Yeah, and one more thing I would like to clear is that uh, the number of lines added or deleted or the white space is done by each user. Th these are just the highest numbers. Like for addition, so top, this is the top ten. Yeah, top ten it's for e each each column. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. And then I have visualized that for top five users how most, many yep so this is over the whole history of auger who has committed the most lines yep who has come to the most lines let's see and then so, i see in the flyover help actually ragava you have those broken down into a, a white space and additions and deletions uh, might be good to use different colors there and provide yep. a, a, a Legend. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Hey, listen. So, could you could you guys kind of talk about like what what it took to get here, irrespective of whether or not these are the right endpoints to have? Yeah. Um, well, we we took the model that Elizabeth specified at face value. We didn't ask some of the critical questions about whether or not this is really welcoming this. We treat we were analysts and technic we were more technicians than analysts just okay here's the things in this model let's put them all in there uncritically and as many as we can do anyway and it took some time to uh have Ragava get up to you know familiar with auger and how to get data out of it it took me some analysis time to identify all the endpoints for the specific metrics and create that metric endpoint map and then we just went through several iterations of visualiz visualizing the data. And I'd say that we're probably not done with this yet, but we have all of the pieces functional. Um, I've made like eight notes here so far about things I wanna change in it already. But I think, you know, it's like a working model. It's like off of zero is kind of the goal. Yep. And our, pro our process was very much just aimed at getting a working example out there in the fastest form that we could in that that it was the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Do you have any, yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Regava, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Sean is absolutely right. Like we thought like understanding this process is more important than we would be getting the metric models for other people more easier way. So we, we thought of doing it like this. Do you have any thoughts on like the amount of labor that has gone into this? So, I mean, this, this was the first one, right? And so right. we had to conceptualize like how to just get off a of zero. And right. I think, so there's a lot of just like initial thinking about it, um, labor in there. I don't know how much, how many hours Regava has put into it. I've probably got 30 or 40. Okay. And, but I think subsequent metric models will be easier to, to develop and we'll iterate on them and develop some sort of standard visual presentation, which we didn't quite get to in this iteration. Right. So I think, so I think there's, you know, this is basically a off of zero. That was our goal. Okay. <clears throat> Do you think it's about the same amount of time that it takes to say develop a chaos metric or more? Like pretending you have a, a completed metrics model. I'm just trying to think about like just labor in this. No, I think I think the um, the completed like because we've built this example, I think it becomes an example that can be built off of, which is why okay. we should probably think about whether or not what other technologies we could possibly use and reuse the Python code that we have and produce something that is more quickly and easily visually inspectable. Okay. Um, by a user, right? Because having to scroll down the page doesn't let you think of all the information at once. It makes you scroll. And so I, I think like thinking about things like that is important, but this is still better than nothing because it can be implemented 
that way by others as well. Like I'm trying to think of as we develop the metrics models, the markdown files, the not implemented markdown files. Right. And if, if the associated Jupyter notebook that you're showing here is a, a huge, if it's an extensive amount of labor, like, I don't want, I think this I was like you to feel like yeah. <laughs> there's every time we release a metrics model, you inherit 80 hours of work. Well, I, yeah, that's a good point. I, I, so I've, there's a couple of Google summer code projects that would get at helping us build these. Um, and I, I do think that much of the labor this time was just having to think it all through from beginning to sure, end. Sure. That makes time. sense. So maybe, yeah, maybe like this is a better question for like one the second one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe once another one has been developed. Yeah. Okay. Because I think it will go a lot faster on the second one. Okay. There was a lot of uh, foundational work that we did thinking That's this cool. through. Okay. Yeah. And then we have new contributors. So this one's just taking advantage of a visualization API endpoint that Augur already has. And it just it delivers the just a visual uh, SVG or PNG. And so we just call the API, get the PNG and put it in here. That's why this one looks so much different than the others. The, the ideal, you know, for me, the ideal world would be that we have endpoints, like we take some of this work and maybe it becomes a visualization endpoint and then those can maybe be assembled on a page, but that's, that's auger specific. I think the other thing we can do is when we develop these models, we could look at Grimoire Lab SIG ILS and see what panels have been developed that might fit some of what this metric model is. So, like backing a panel into a metric model, because there's like 70 of them. So, I think we may be able to illustrate some parts of some models in one to three Grimoire Lab pages. Okay. I love how it says grammar lab pages <laughs> in the transcription. Oh, I can't see it. Only you see the transcription in real time because you push the button. Uh, I did not um, know that. Yeah. And I, I guess I could turn it on, but I don't have it on. Okay. And the next thing we have is uh, new contributors EOIs. So, so how, how many, many new contributors in each year? Yep. That's really useful. We, were, we just had a presentation mm. internally on kind of the pipeline. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Do we have any way of saying like contributors who started in two, 2020 are still around in? Is there any met metric like that? Yes, yeah. there's. Um, a second time contributor and regular contributor visualization endpoint that we didn't include here. Oh, that's okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, there's a, if you scroll up just a little bit, Regava, keep going to the graphs, that one. So that one in the bottom right corner, it's not exactly that, but this is a one that Sean has put together. Oh there. yeah. This, like, this shows this first, yeah, second contribution. So people who contribute for a second time which is a really nice way of looking at things. <laughs> yeah. I think that um, that last uh, bar in the bar chart is a little um, confusing because it's actually year to date. So it's a different. Um, oh, different date. yeah. Oh, so I think, I think these are divided by quarter. Hmm. Yeah, it should be. Yeah. Specified time period. Uh, sorry, it says oh, it does say quarter at the bottom of it. Actually, uh, if you um, scroll, if you, <laughs> if you scroll, so if you scroll back up to the chart we were looking at just before this, that's the one I was referring to. The lower one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. So keep going. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So the 2022 data is obviously. Yeah, it's year to date. That is yes. That that is a common problem. When like anytime you're looking at something monthly, the current month is not a good piece of information to include. Um, yeah, like I am even done for the months. 
So can I just kind of, we have just a few minutes left here. Um, could I ask just kind of what people's thoughts are, like, not on the welcomeness metric model, but, you know, just kind of the metric model connected to now what you're seeing with these Jupyter notebooks, um, Sean's design approach, you know, remember on that design.md file, kind of this path of we create a metrics model, we create a design.md, and then it moves into a, at least at this point, a, a notebook development. Do people have thoughts on this? or reactions or concerns? Nothing, all good. I feel like um, it was hard to, to draw conclusions because of the, um, of the user experience, because user, user interface design issues. Exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's super interesting and I'm, I'm really psyched about how possible it is, how plausible it is to put the data together. Like you guys got this done really fast. Mm -hmm. So that's impressive. And I have high hopes. Cool. Theoretically, it should have been faster, Lucas, because I should have known where to look for all these endpoints and mm -hmm. how they were mapped. And they were at one point mapped directly to the metrics, but we had, at the very beginning of the project, maybe through 2019, we were changing the website so often that I just stopped trying to include a link to the yeah. chaos metric in the API docs. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I'll just echo that, that it, I'm, it's amazing that this all come together. I wasn't expecting this today. Um, I think when I look at the uh, Jupyter notebooks, I think, it'd be nice to have a little bit of a description under there, like new contributors, you can use this too, or this like just some sort of, just to make it more user-friendly. Like I think for all of us that look at stuff like this all the time, we're like, oh yeah, that's the, this, and it means that. Yep. Maybe there's just, because I was focusing on how the comments will help people learn, but also I think they'll need that intro. And I, I don't know how hard that is, but maybe that's just like a it's field that we, hard. yeah. If, so I, if you, you look know. at the, yeah, if you look at the visualization endpoints, I've always been very, directive about including um, legends and descriptions of the visualization because all, all visualizations are hard to interpret without some kind of legend or description and um, fell away a little bit had, toward the end on this one with some of these, but we'll go back and make that more I present. Think can, I think we can cover that. Ragava, can you stop sharing your screen for a second? So, Emma, if you, I think one of the things that we're trying to do with the metrics models, again, I just keep going back to the DEI event badging one, mm -hmm. but we have, right, we have the metric here, mm. and then we have a small description as to why. Yep. Oh, that's a really good idea. Yeah. And so then we could include that in the Jupyter Notebook as well. This is why do we have this metric? And maybe even to your point, Emma, a little bit more of how this could help you, and we could or just kind of have it here and in the Jupyter Notebook as well. Right. Yeah, and these are all focused like to, on DE and I, like you could talk about other things to make an event successful, mm -hmm. right? But um, this is like pretty well, well, this is a good thing to reference just as a, like, it's so easy to understand. Yeah, yeah. just to kind That's of- That's what we need, yeah. Just help uh, orient people a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's significant that the text for each metric probably changes depending on the model. Yeah, probably so. Because even when I was looking at that, really good point. The age of issue one, or whichever one it was, like it meant different things for the in, in different scenarios. I could certainly see that. I think that's that's an excellent point. So this this would change, yeah, based on based on yeah, that. like our our safety one, right? Like we would talk mm -hmm. about that being like related to safety <laughs> but we would describe it a little bit differently and it's a really good challenge i think for us too to do that and i think that'll make it even more valuable it's yeah. pretty exciting point well taken cool maybe we maybe we could add some description about uh, um we could help what kind of people and um, because uh, um different people have different requirements for this metric 
for example, if the manager, um, maybe they only want uh, the top five people of the project, it's enough. Um, if the maintainer, um, maybe they want to know the bottom, the bottom five people um, of maintainer, and they, they could uh, um, find out uh, why um, the maintainer, um, why the maintainer um, not contribute well um, um, at re recent time. So I think we could add, uh, um, we, we could add what kind of people um, we can help. I like that. And I think we've kind of talked about this in terms of roles and the different roles that there are out there and how the different roles could have okay. kind of approached these models differently. So I think that's a point well taken. Thanks, June. All right, folks, we are at the end. I'm glad that we got to see this. Um, Sean and Ragava, uh, you know, thank you <laughs> so much for kind of putting these into practice. I think this is really kind of the first time we're seeing this. So this is yeah. really great. So while we were sitting here, I figured out how to hide all code on a Jupyter notebook. So <laughs> apparently somebody else had thought of that before. So <laughs> I'll um I'll push that change up. I want to spin this up. I just your readme should take me through the steps to spin this up for myself. Is that if true? If it doesn't, you should open an issue and tag me. And so because <laughs> I, I'm so familiar with these things. I think mm -hmm. I've described everything that uh, uh, right, you know, you would do. But if I if it doesn't work, then it's not your fault. It's my fault. And open an issue and let us know. Okay, we'll come for you. It doesn't. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will come for you. All right, everybody. It was good lot. to see you. Uh, right. You know, have a good right. evening. Stay safe. Bye. Bye, everybody. Good job, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.